So Pickens chemistry students, this stuff going on with the photoelectron spectra is really pretty crazy because it's showing us that not only are there shells to these atoms, as Bohr told us, not only is there a first shell and a second shell, and this is really what Bohr's model of the atom was explaining, but it's also showing us that there's other levels of structure here to these electrons and how they exist within the atom. So the other thing to notice is that as we go from our n equals one, as we go from our first period of the periodic table to the next period, we are changing our n values. So now that we're at the end here with neon, what do you think would happen if we go from neon to sodium? If we go from neon to sodium, now we're gonna be looking at N equals three. Where do you think that next electron is gonna go in our spectra here? Well, it's actually gonna create that third shell. And so see here we have two, two, six, one. And so this now is starting to show us some structure to the electrons and how they exist in the atom. This is showing us that there is actually some stuff going on here with the pattern of the periodic table. Notice that the first section over here happens to be too wide, and that's exactly how many electrons can be held whenever you start a new period. And that after you pass through those first two electrons in your new period, you come to a different section of the periodic table, which is six wide, one, two, three, four, five, six. And here we see neon with a peak here for six. And so the second shell for neon has these two electrons here, along with these six electrons here. And that what chemists have called this, if I just do a super quick sketch of the periodic table, what chemists have called this, and I really kind of messed up in the middle there, is this section here is called the S block. And when we talk about those electrons, that's what we call those. And this section over here is called the P block. And the helium and the hydrogen, those are really both part of the S block. And that helium, we would say helium is, has electrons in the 1s. And something like neon here, these six electrons here, we would say those are in the 2p, which is where neon happens to be. And if we look at sodium, then we see that sodium has 2, 2, 6, 1, and that the electron here would be in the third shell. And because it's in the third shell, and it's the first one in the third shell, it's also in the S block. And so we would describe that as a 3S electron. So we can also use these spectra, and this is really cool. We can use these spectra to identify unknowns. So without any further information, just knowing that these lines are one, two, three, four, five, six, if this is all you see, is a peak for two electrons, and that's all that's coming out of that atom, well, then that means that atom only has two electrons, and you could match that up with helium. We can go back and look at helium again and show you that that one is the same as the 2.37 for the helium, okay? We could also look at another unknown, and I would like for you to go ahead and pause this spectra here and I will place the periodic table to the side and I would like for you to look at this spectra and puzzle through and try to figure out which element this is. This would be your last chance to pause the video. So this particular element has two electrons, two and six electrons. So this is a full first shell. This is a full second shell. And then it has another two and another three electrons. So this is in the third shell. And you could count over five. You could count over one and two, and then one, two, three. So this element here, this is actually a spectrum for phosphorus. 
And you could figure that out based off of the particular peaks that you see. In fact, here is an example of a real spectrum. I was waiting for my camera to update. Printed out a, a little bit of a fuzzy resolution, but here is a picture of actual data from a real instrument with photoelectron spectroscopy. And you can see how, how whomever collected this labeled the particular peaks with the what are called orbital designations. So the number would be the shell and the S or the P would be known as the orbital for those electrons. And you can see typical transitions here for nitrogen and titanium and oxygen and nitrogen. So this is probably some sort of titanium or titanium oxide or titanium nitrate even you would need some more information to figure out what the specific chemical form was, but you do know, you can tell from this, that titanium and oxygen and nitrogen are all present in this sample because you see these particular photoelectron peaks. And there's even more information in here about how the electrons themselves are arranged. And so one of the things we can do with One of the things that we can do with oxygen is that we can take a beam of oxygen and we can actually force it to pass through a magnet. And I'm gonna to try to draw a little U bar magnet here. And here's our oxygen beam coming through. And as that oxygen beam comes through, when it goes through that magnet, it can be deflected. And those atoms can be deflected in different directions. This means that oxygen is magnetic And this deflection is going to tell us that the electrons, there must be unpaired electrons, some number of them. Or let's just say some electrons are unpaired. And so when we look at these shells here and we look at these particular orbitals, we know we have a 2s and we can ignore the 1s in here. We know they're there. But for this, I'm going to ignore those. And we can say there's a 2s. And we know that there are two electrons in that 2s. And we know that there's a 2p. And that there are four electrons in that 2p. Well, this doesn't help us out so much. What we know from electrons is that electrons tend to pair up. And so if these are 2 and 4, well, then those are all going to be paired if these are how those orbitals look. So then we can try saying, okay, well, maybe each orbital holds two electrons. And this is going to be um, something that we'll talk about a little bit more on a different day. So let's say that there are two orbitals here now for the 2p, and that there's two and two, and two electrons in the 2s. Well, our electrons here are still going to be paired up. So what happens if we make three 2p orbitals? and a 2s orbital. Well, we still have two electrons in the 2s. And if we put two and two in the 2p orbitals like that, well, they're still paired. So really what must be going on is that those three orbitals, in order to make this, allow this to be magnetic, we have to have two electrons and then one and one. And these are our unpaired electrons here and here. And those two unpaired electrons are going to be what can make oxygen atoms act in a magnetic fashion. And so we see that there are magnetic constraints or magnetic ways that these electrons also behave. And all of these rules kind of come together. This here where the electrons spread out like this is going to be something called Hund's rule. And the splitting here of the orbitals, splitting of orbitals, is going to somehow be related to magnetism.
And otherwise, we can see that with those three orbitals there, we can still fit two, four, six electrons into these two p's. And so we still see that there are six across here in the p block.